my mom went from a vibrant vertical person to a horizontal pain addict. And so we said, mom, we borrowed one of these platforms, try it out. So she gets on it in about two weeks, she's up with no cane and no pain. Do you understand? She was bedridden for 22 hours a day. Let's talk about the skeletal system. All the skeletal system is designed to do is hold us up. And from my standpoint, it just stands in the way of me getting to the heart because there's this dumb bone right here. Why is it so crucial as a, as a metabolic organ? Well, it's really interesting. And it's, this is one of these obvious elephants in the room that gets overlooked by even the smartest spine surgeons in the world. And I know thousands of them have met them. So I'm telling you this firsthand. The skeleton is an organ system. So we have 11 or 12, depending how you want to categorize it. And each bone's an organ, but it's a full organ system. And it's an organ system that doesn't have a medical specialty. Yeah. And so, so much of the science gets overlooked and doesn't get used clinically. Most people don't realize is that we think of bones as holding us up. That's its primary job. That's actually about third on the list, <laughs> believe it or not. Bones' primary functions are metabolic, not structural. So let me talk about that for All a minute. All right. <laughs> so I have a, a great chart on this. And, you know, when you, every one of the little items we've heard independently, when you put it together, it starts to paint a very different picture. So bones' primary function is to produce stem cells. Yep. And it produces really two classifications. I call them liquids and solids. So, so you have hemopoietics, which are blood. So it produces all of our red blood cells for oxygen transport. It produces all of our white blood cells for our, our immune system. Yep. And it also produces platelets. Yep. This is all from the bone. And those are all very, very important. Very important. Then there's another classification of stem cells called mesenchymals, or we call them solids. Okay. And they produce, these cells can become one of about five to eight things that we know of. So bone, muscle, fat, cartilage, connective tissue, which sounds a lot like a joint, doesn't it? Yep. But we've also recently found out these become endothelial cells, liver cells, and sensory nerve cells. And so that's just one function. That's just the stem cell production of bone, but it gets even more. Bone is a, regulates our calcium, rates in our blood to keep our heart pumping at the proper speeds yep. and minerals, but it's also a full member of the endocrine system in all but name. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Bone chemically talks to every other organ in the body with a first or second hand conversation. And so what we see is when people get proper skeletal health, it's a systemic effects. It goes way beyond just what we think of just holding us up. And so the way I tell the world is, if you want to be healthy and you don't take care of your skeleton, good luck. Because you're just, you're chasing the deficiency of a major organ system. I call it the second most important organ system in the body. Now, I've backed that up. Every specialist thinks they're number two. We're all fighting for number two. The brain's number one. But I think no, the heart's the number one. Exactly. Come on. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but I think as we as you learn more, as we all do, we'll we'll realize it really is number two. So that's an opinion, but I'll I'll defend it. Well, you know, I see a lot of uh, particularly women patients, but more and more male patients who, when they think about bone, they're not necessarily thinking about arthritis or joint health. They're thinking about osteopenia and osteoporosis. And that happened to the astronauts, right? Absolutely. Can we, can we talk about that? That's kind of where all this started, right? Absolutely. One of the prime motivations for this was they, you know, they'd send astronauts in space and in this zero gravity environment, an astronaut who is in top physical condition will lose more bone in one month than a severe osteoporosis patient will in a year. Well, I mean, it's severe. So when they come back, they have a, you know, a substantial rehabilitation process. And so that shows us, that's the first indicator that bone without the proper loading has a metabolic really dormancy. This kind of shuts it down. And that becomes applicable to people on earth when you really dig down into it, because a lot of people on earth kind of live in an isolated environment. You know, we don't exercise properly. We don't do the proper exercise. And we get what I call mechanical scurvy. Huh. And you'll see 
that this, you know, scurvy was a disease that killed sailors for 300 years. It limited world superpowers projection of their navies. Yep. So there was a huge motivation to find a cool cure. And it was a James Lind, a Scottish surgeon, who found a reference 300 years earlier and took a group of sailors and gave them fruit. And another group didn't give them fruit. And it was a very small group. Citrus fruit. That's correct. And he found, didn't know why, but he found the ones with citrus didn't get scurvy. It's now known as the world's first clinical trial. Now, it confounded the conventional wisdom at the time because they were looking for the four rumors and the contagion and this and that. So it took over 20 years before the British Navy added that to the sailor's diet, which Hence is where we the get name the name Limeys. Limeys. Yep. <laughs> exactly. But see, that's an example. You know, history repeats itself, or at least rhymes, as Mark Twain said, where the science led ahead of the medicine. And so there's a 20 or 30 years where sailors were needlessly suffering when the solution was right there. And what I've seen today, and I've devoted my career to now, is taking science and getting it over to the medical side. They're two different worlds. And I call it the Grand Canyon, one side of the canyon and the other. And those bridges across are very expensive to build. They're called double blind perspective multicenter randomized studies. And there's a place for those, but there's a lot of good things on one side of the canyon that aren't over here. And it's my goal in life is to find those and get those to the people. And many of them aren't profitable, but it doesn't mean they're not useful. And gotcha. so if that makes so we see history repeats itself. And that's why in some respects I call Juvet a vitamin of exercise. Gotcha. So was this, I've seen pictures of, sure. of this being used in space. Absolutely. And I mean, that's literally kind of where this device kind of started out. Yeah, NASA funded the original research and they were trying to find a way to mechanically stimulate the bones. And then part of that was doing this and they did it in a, in a simulated zero G environment and found out that it works. And so, however, they also found that there's a natural equivalent, which is walking. Yeah. And so is this on the space station? No. But does it mean the science can't be useful down here? It still can. And so what we find is that walking is nature's perfect form of impact exercise. But it's not the only form, and it's not the most efficient form. And that's why Juvent can be used to mimic what we find in nature. Again, very similar to a vitamin. So, you know, I can take a vitamin C pill if I don't have a perfect diet of fruit, you know, that sort of thing. And so similarly, we can address the, a deficiency with people who can't walk or don't walk. But that's just one group. We'll talk more about that later, I'm sure. So I mentioned in the lead in to the program, micro impact. Probably uh, walking is a good example of micro impact. In fact, I've, I've got a very good friend, Mark Sisson, who wrote the Primal Blueprint, he designed Primal Kitchen. He was mm -hmm. a great triathlete uh, in his day. And Mark uh, will be coming out with a book soon called Walk, Don't Run. And he actually now believes that the farthest distance a human being should run is 100 yards. And that humans, like you say, were actually designed to walk. Most of the super old people in the, quote, blue zones uh, are walkers. They live in hilly communities and they walk. So it's actually the, the walking micro impact process that is really good for you. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's put a little finer point on that because okay. it's a good, it's a very good point. I'll call walking as impact as a baseline. Yeah. And then running is kind of too much of a good thing. And what Juven is doing is we'll call micro impact in that context, because what we're doing is exploiting a property of bone. So bone is extremely mechano resilient, meaning it can take a beating and take it. So when you run, bones love it, but it's the rest of the body, not so much. Starting at cartilage, so I mean, which is right next door neighbor. It's got a much more narrow window of desirable mechanical stimulation. It can get too much of a good thing. That's why running is kind of a mixed bag. Right. So walking is a safe level, but walking is fairly low frequency. So we're looking maybe one, two, three hertz. Okay. 
So what the scientists found is that bone is not only mechano-resilient, it's also mechanosensitive, meaning it can get its work done with small loads if given enough of them. And that's where the micro impact is a kind of a biohack, if that makes sense. So that's, a, you know, we work a lot in that field and this fits. But what it's doing is it's the person standing on the platform and it's applying a very gentle force, but it's doing it at about 32 to 37 hertz. And the frequency is important because the rest of the body is sensitive to that. So what we're doing is we're finding an area where the bone can respond and the rest of the body says, yeah, that's great. I'm fine with that. And so when you get beyond those parameters, you can start getting into where the bone's fine, but the rest of the body starts getting in trouble. And so that's a very key component. So when a person stands on a juvent, they're very underwhelmed. I mean, you know, you've yeah. been using it. Yeah, I've been using it. And, you know, the movement is incredibly small. It's 5% of one millimeter. That's it. That's it. And you know why? That's safe and it's effective. And that's a see, safe, effective, and convenient is the triad. Right. It's very difficult to get all three of those. And so that's what Juven is. And there's $40 million of research, 90 plus papers in the clinical side, I mean, the scientific side and the clinical side that kind of came to those parameters. Well, let's dive into that part sure. because the plate that vibrates. Um, <laughs> okay, there's lots of plates that vibrate. Maybe we'll get into that towards the end. But sure. I mean, what does the research say about micro-impact therapy? Why, why would I be interested yeah. in that? Okay, that's interesting. Let's go back 100 years. Okay. Julius Wolff is an orthopedic surgeon in Germany, came up with now what's called Wolff's Law. And it says bone grows where bone is loaded. And this has been a cornerstone of orthopedics for years. We've kind of known this. But in the past 20 years, we know that it's not quite so simple. Bone distinguishes between static loading, which would be like a weightlifting, just a force that just stays there for a long time, and impact loading, which would be everything from walking, running, and in this case, micro impact. Jumping. That's correct. And that impact load provides a function. It's called mechanotransduction, if you want to look it up. And in this case, what it does is it's providing one of the parameters required for a cell transfer function. So cell transfer is a complete body of science on its own. It's over my head. Uh, I'm an engineer, I'm not a biologist. But what it is, a cell controls very greatly what it lets in and what it lets out. And those transfers are various. There's a catalog of them. There's a whole field of that. Yep. One of them requires an impact wave. And that's one of the mechanisms of action that Juvent is engaging. So it's really like a metabolic catalyst or exercise for your bones. And if we see, we know how many metabolic functions are happening. My God, you can see the impact. And we have patients that tell us independently that don't know each other. So many things that start to just get better. We don't have studies on them. We don't make the claims. But, you know, Dr. Corey had a great quote. I'm going to use it. He said, what's the plural of anecdotal? It's called data. <laughs> <laughs> and so over a while, you start to see, and I've spent 10 years digging into listening to these patient after patient after patient saying, my blood pressure, my diabetes management, my erectile ED issues, my RLS, restless sleep syndrome. And you go, wow, this can't be coincidental. We didn't even talk about it. They're, well, when you go into the literature, you start to see reasonable mechanisms of action. And, you know, you sent me an article the other day that opened my eyes to things I haven't even seen before. And so to that, I mean, this is a very broad topic. It's an entire organ system. And we will study this for another 100 years. Where did the idea that, I mean, three megahertz or moving like three millimeters, that was the magic number or most effective number? Why don't we just jump on a trampoline or sure. get in a... Paint well, that's a, that's a pretty complicated topic. You really have two parameters that you kind of need to it distills down to For, uh, intensity, which would be like the volume knob. Okay. You know, sound, if yep. you can make it louder and frequency, which would be the equivalent of pitch. And so what they did, they found out that you, what you want to do is stimulate bone without disproportionately stimulating other organ systems. And so 32 to 37 is a nice mixture between transmissibility and non-interference with other organ systems. And so 
within that range, a PhD work, you know, juvenile this part of the program, he got a, a three or four patents on choosing within that safe range the optimum frequency for each person at each time. See, because part of the safety is magnitude or the volume. You've got to use low level energy because you don't want to beat the body up. The body can handle fairly high loads of impact, way beyond 0.3 G, which is juvenile. So why does juvenile have to be 0.3 G to be safe? Because the body never sees high loads at high frequency. It always sees them at low frequency. So running is even low frequency. That's one or two hertz, okay? And the body, each impact wave has time to dissipate before the next one comes along. When you increase the frequency, it's a totally different mechanical system. And you've got to lower the level. And so that's why that combination, if you're going to get all those cycles in, you've really got to go down. And that's what keeps it safe. But if you're going to use low energy for safety, you've got to make it efficient. And there's a physics phenomenon that's true in all fields called resonance. And resonance is how a small amount of energy at the proper frequency can do a lot of work. That's the singer breaking the opera glass. Gotcha. Makes sense? Yeah. And so the PhD, he, in, in controls engineering, which you engineers know, this is really hard math. When the person gets on a juvent, it will go through the safest, the safe range and find the optimal range for that person at that time. And that can change. If we lose weight with proper diet, that frequency might be different. If we have a different floor surface, different size and shape, that's why when you get on it, it does all the math. It looks simple, but it's not. Yeah, so you know, you get on it and there's a countdown of 12. That's right. And I'm going, yeah, okay, well, you know, it's counting down to 12. So what is it doing during that 12 seconds? Sure, so what it's doing is it's observing residents. So it's sweeping through a, a range of, of- So I'm a tuning fork? Absolutely. You're absolutely, that's, that's a very accurate thing. It's listening for the perfect pitch. And in the bottom, there's an accelerometer which measures motion. Mm -hmm. And it talks to the computer and it starts to go, wait a minute, the, the, got it. And what's really interesting is you can get on it, plug your ears, and you'll feel the frequencies go up and there'll be one that'll be louder than others. And then when it locks in, that's the frequency it's gonna be. And if it can't find it, it'll error out. It's very specific, it's very fail safe. Interesting. So literally, I mean, it, it's not humbug that I'm just standing there. It's literally choosing my frequency that it, that's going to work for me. Absolutely. And if your wife or your child or your yeah, friend, wife, or, your, yeah. or, yeah, or, or in-laws or anybody gets on it, it, it'll do the same math. And it's observing and not calculating it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so it's, it's knocking it. It's a very important tool. And Juvent goes way beyond its... I mean, its energy input is minimal. I mean, it's about nine or 10 watts, but it swings way above its pay grade in terms of energy because it's finding resonance. Frequency is everything. Just ask Tesla, but I mean, that's all another can of worms. That, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so that's just not a silly sales point that it's, you know, it's, it's taking, it's learning about me in those 12 seconds. It literally is. Oh, absolutely, it, it adjusts. And it's extremely effective and you know, it has so many things it's you know that we could talk of two or three podcasts on that but i mean everybody gets on a juvent for a reason yeah and they'll stay on it for three or four they wouldn't even dream were related and you know our policy you know we can't make claims and we don't try to i mean we'll we'll give observations but we let everybody try it for six weeks and if they don't think it's worth the money we buy it back 100% our success rate with that metric is 98%. That's pretty good. That's right. And that's why we're pretty cocky about it. You know, it's funny because a lot of disbelievers and doctors, it's fun. I mean, I, I, I get it. I just like say, you know, how many procedures have that policy? Yeah. You know, and it's, we're, we're pretty cocky on it. Just, it's our experience. Well, let's put it two ways. Number one, you probably think that every human being should be on a juvent. Who usually is is most interested in a juvenile? Well, you know, that's as I alluded to, they get on it for a reason. Right. And one of the most common reasons we see is bone density. We have do have clinical studies on that in bone health, but also could be joint pain. Okay, those are big motivations. 
but they get on it. They see things they wouldn't even dream of, you know, everything from heck, even constipation, you know, uh, lower limb edema. And, you know, these are things that they wouldn't even think of. And then their whole family's on it. The other group we see are pro athletes. When they get on it for performance enhancement, um, there's three or four things they, they've they told us over the years. Um, if you know, I'm also sure. But if you look at it, who should be on a juvent? Let me bring up a reference because it explains so many things. It's a vitamin. And that's when it hit me one day. And let me explain that if you don't mind. Yeah, I've actually great. invented a new word if you don't mind. I'd like to explain it to you. But I want to give you the background. So a vitamin has, in the chemical sense, has three characteristics that are really relevant. It's found in nature, it's required for normal metabolism, and it's always a subcomponent. So for example, vitamin C is my favorite analogy. It fits all of those, but there aren't vitamin C trees. There's orange trees, grapefruit, fruit trees. So, but we've learned the active ingredient, how to synthesize it, make it more convenient. Yeah. Okay. So if I look at mechanical loading for the body, I know I need impact loading as well as I need static loading. And the analogy I use is, you know, in, in the chemical side, we have fat, protein, carbs, and micronutrients. So fats and proteins, those are fundamental daily requirements. They're non-negotiable, non-interchangeable, and we deal with it. But mechanically, we have impact and non-impact. Non-negotiable, non-interchangeable, fundamental daily requirements. That's rare territory. The last vitamin discovery was actually in the 40s, vitamin K. Yeah. Okay. But this analogy of a vitamin just keeps getting more and more relevant. It's the same dosing. It's the same response, the same retention, and the same indication. So let me elaborate. Dosing. Uh -huh. I can't do my vitamin dose on January 1st to be done for the year. I need it regularly. Darn. Response. If I have a vitamin one day and I do I notice everything magically different? No. I'm giving the body what it needs to get what it needs done. And that's a process, not an event. So it's the same response. Same retention. If I miss a vitamin for a day, it's not the end of the world. It's going to be fine. But if I go deficient long enough, I'm going to get present. Same indication. From pediatric to geriatric. Interestingly, one of the groups studied in the, uh, from the original Juvent team was pediatrics who couldn't get normal impact loading for development. So, for example, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, spina bifida, those kids, they have a terrible issues. Yeah. But I've talked to the parents and worked with them. They say, listen, we've got to be careful. He's like an eggshell. His bones haven't developed. And so that's a group that at a young age can get on a Juvent and metabolically it's relevant. Same thing with St. Jude did a study on young adults doing post-chemo bone marrow transplants. Young adults at a young age, poor bone health. And they, this study is amazing. Actually, they did a, um, it was prospective, randomized, blinded study. And they managed these patients um, nutritionally and endocrinologically to eliminate those things. And the outcome was so dramatic that the JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, before they would publish it, required two separate groups to look at the data hmm. because their bone growth was a delta of 10 to 11%. The control group was down one, which is normal, and the active group was up by 10, so a delta of 11. See, the age doesn't matter. Anything that keeps you from getting normal physiological loading means, guess what? Juvent's a requirement. And what happens when we get older? We start to slow down. And people's skeletal system starts to go into dormancy. And so what we do as a culture, we ignore it. The way I look at it, I said, can you imagine a culture that said, well, you're older now. You can't run after animals. No protein for you. You can't climb trees and go in the field, no fruit and veggies for you. You can't walk to the well, no water for you. We call that aging. Come on, we don't do that. But that's exactly what we do for impact loading. Slowing down a little joint pain, here's a cane. You know, that still hurts, here's a walker. You know what, why don't you just give up all that walking and get in a wheelchair? We call that aging. Well, their skeletal system is shutting down. You've got the second most important organ system going into dormancy. Doesn't end well. Uh, no. Now, 
the first person I noticed this was when we were doing due diligence on Juvent, my brother and I were starting a functional medicine clinic before that term was even invented. And part of that was investigating different treatments and again, science that wasn't being applied clinically. Well, Juvent had a pretty strong pedigree. The founder of the company died and the company went in dormancy. So a colleague brought it to us and we were very familiar with this other bone healing successes, which were used in post-surgical site-specific non-fusions. If, you know. But this was the holy grail go after Juvin. Well, we were doing the due diligence. By coincidence, my mother, at 78 years old, was suffering from a non-union pelvic fracture two years pre-existing. Now, this is a pain that is on the scale of 1 to 10. It's probably at 9.9. .9. Yep. Pain meds can't touch it. My mom went from a vibrant vertical person to a horizontal pain addict. And so we said, Mom, we borrowed one of these platforms. Try it out. So she gets on it in about two weeks, she's up with no cane and no pain. Do you understand? She was bedridden for 22 hours a day. And we were like, whoa. whoa. And so, you know, you, you think, is this placebo? We don't know, you know, but you know, my mom's a pretty tough cookie. So this goes on for two weeks and then we have to give this platform back because it was barred from an osteoporosis patient. Mm. My mom went right back down. And I got a call from her and she said, Peter, I don't know what you can do with that company, but I need one of those platforms. And I could just hear it. It was sad, actually. I was just like, Mom, I'll get one. I'll find something. So I scoured eBay. I found one. It took me about two weeks of daily searching to find one on in Canada on Craigslist. Guy's mom died. He had no idea what it did. I said, I'll take it. So we put her on it. The rest is history. My mom is 92 years old. She's living in a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a guest house and a swimming pool by herself. No. Oh. And it's my opinion that she would be in a nursing home. And I, you know, that I've seen hundreds of similar cases since then where people's activity level just goes back. And my Pete Simonson's guess on this is the way I look at it is, you know, I just realized we could probably add five years to every 300 million people's vertical lifespan. And health span. Yeah. Health span, I'm not gonna say I can make your life longer. That's a bigger claim, but well, maybe it does. The point is, it's like, if this thing keeps you out of a nursing home for a month, it's paid for itself. <laughs> yeah. So back to your question of who should be on a juvent, the answer is yes. You know, I mean, it's pretty much, and everyone's got a different motivation. And that's all fun subtopics, but that's a long answer to a great question. I keep coming back to micro impact because one of the things when I first started using this is there's not a lot happening. And are you sure about this? There's not a lot happening. Because, I mean, what I was doing was checking my emails and things like that, or looking out the window. We have a lovely view where this is set up. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, are you sure? Because there's not a lot happening. Now, I'll bring it up. I think we have a question later. But uh, I used to have a power plate and recommended it. But Quite frankly, I didn't use it very much. Um, it was it was a pain in the neck. And if you even put your uh, jaw together and put your teeth, it actually didn't feel very good on right. your teeth. And any kind of movement was eh, not a lot of fun. And, and this, it doesn't feel like a power plate. And so, but at least with the power plate, Man, you knew something was happening, right? More, more must be better, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because not much is happening, do people write in and say, uh, not much is happening? Or right. It's interesting. There's a couple of fun points you brought up here. Remember, a vitamin. We're not a painkiller. We're not a treatment that I get, oh, instant relief. Yeah. We're letting the body do what it does. And so what we do is we send out a simple pain inventory sheet for everyone and say, you know, day one, just you're the only one that's ever going to see this. Just circle where you have pain and put a number on it. And over time, they'll go back and look at that and they go, oh, wow, I, you know, I forgot about that. Or their friends will notice it before, before they do. They're going to, you know, you're walking upstairs normally. You're not really using your cane and, and that sort of thing. Now, back to the high energy plates, it's really interesting. One of the groups I've worked with over the years is pro athletes, okay, NFL players, yeah. uh, golf players, and um, baseball players. So these are people who are super in tune with their health. And I've learned to listen to them. Now, they may not have the scientific words, but if you listen to them carefully, the way they describe something, they're usually telling you something that's gold. I've 
almost without exception, they've been on a power plate. Yeah. Okay? I've never met one that uses it more than, I guess, twice. They get off and say, that, I don't know. That, I don't feel good on that. And they know. It's really, I've learned to really pay attention to that. And when we first started with Juve and the pro athletes, I didn't have a lot to go on. And I don't BS. I said, look, I don't know. You tell me. Without exception, they came back with very similar usage patterns and descriptions. And so they, um, if they use it pre-performance, they feel they have better balance and better range of motion. Okay. And those are big things for an athlete, especially, you know, a swinger, a skate, I mean, skaters, a hockey players, that sort of thing. If they use it post-workout, they get a significant reduction in what they call DOMS. It's not a medical term. It's a kind of a subculture term called delayed onset muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. And for a pro athlete, that tends to be the limit of their training because it's not about motivation and money and time. They've got all that. It's their DOMS. They'll know that. They'll schedule. They go, you know, you couldn't usually do that many workouts, but I could fit another one in. You know, it's, it was a supplement to that. And then the final thing that they did was most pro athletes, especially football players, for example, they all have an injury. They have to learn to play around. It's there. And it's not going to stop their career, but it affects them. And after about three to six weeks, they're like, I don't have that pain anymore. Hmm. And then that's the big eureka moment. So it's very interesting. Each group's got its different things. Remember, there's so many physiological things going on here. There's no one thing that applies to all. Right. If that makes sense. The thing I noticed uh, after a few weeks was uh, my flexibility was better. And I'll actually describe the moment I knew that there was something happening. Um, we have a area in our home where our dogs uh, defecate. And uh, once a day, I have to go around with my doggy bag and, and pick it up and bend down. I don't use a shovel or anything like that, but and bend down and and do it. And, you know, I'm in my mid-70s now, and a little, you know, creakiness when I'm bending down. And I'm going, this, this is interesting. I'm effortlessly bending down to pick up my dog's poop now. Uh, now, that's an interesting <laughs> observation. I haven't done anything different. My exercise program hasn't changed. You know, I'm still hiking a lot and walking the dogs two and a half miles every day. But I said, isn't that interesting? That's one thing I noticed. Um, Absolutely. And in probably a month of Sundays, you would not have intuitively predicted that. No, no, that would not have been what I would be looking for. But you're right. And again, I think the most exciting thing about this, from particularly my viewer's standpoint, is there's actually really cool papers written about how this technology changes the microbiome for the better. It makes more diverse microbiome. It makes more friendly microbiome. And I've written about before how, for instance, yoga changes the microbiome for the better. Um, and walking changes the microbiome. So this plays right into where my head gets is we know that bacteria actually enjoy vibration. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I want to thank you for the paper you sent. Because I'm going to toot your horn here for a minute, okay? Because I have met, trained, or introduced technology to literally thousands of doctors around the world. That's what I did for spinal and work with neurosurgeons, spine surgeons, that sort of thing. And I really enjoyed when we first met and chatted your level of questions and depth and follow up. And I applaud you on that because you know I I, I could almost have predicted it, but yes, I see it firsthand. The paper you sent me was a was on a murine, a mouse study, and they were putting mice on vibration and looking at the, the changes. And if, I'll I'll try to go from memory, but some of them were actually pretty remarkable. Now your one, first one is microbiome. Let me try to address that in my engineer terms. Okay, I'm not a biologist, but this way it goes. So cells don't really have a lot of mobility on their own. Okay, they kind of have to go with the flow, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they do, when they come in contact with other cells, they communicate chemically and electronically and that sort of thing. That's how they get a lot of their work done. Correct. And so a micro impact or environment, one of the benefits of exercise is it's an impact loading to shuffle the deck a little bit and they can get their homework done. And, you know, it's called stoichiatic encounters. Basically, it shakes them up. We can't predict everything, but we know they the outcome. They get their interchanges done. Bam. Yeah. The second thing is constipation. I mean, you know, we've had clinicians 
I have a great interview on our one of our channels uh, from a doctorate of physical therapy. And she was treating patients, elderly patients, on extreme constipation measures. I'm talking the meds yeah. and literally having to get enemas once a week. Yeah. And there she's putting them on juvents. They're coming in going, oh, my God, I had a complete elimination. So from a microbiome standpoint, again, keep it moving, the dynamic portion of it. So one of the other things that paper brought out, which I just found kind of jaw-dropping, is reduction of inflammation. Yep. But it was based off the hemopoietics. Okay, hemopoietics, just for our audience, it's basically the stem cells the bone makes are like all liquids and solids. So let's call it blood and bones and guts, okay, if that makes sense. But we've known for a long time the mesenchymal cells that are structural downregulate inflammation. And that's one of the reasons we think people with joint pain generally see a relief over a period of time. So you look at all the itises, arthritis, there's five types. Um, and they all have an itis, and itis means inflammation. Correct. And if the body can downregulate the inflammation, then you've got to win. I didn't realize that the hemopoietics of the blood cells were doing the same thing. And that is very interesting. And that could explain some patients reporting a huge um, improvement in blood pressure management. And I don't know. That'll be a fun one to look at. It's way beyond my pay grade. But your paper was the first one I saw that really opened that up. And uh, that was that's fascinating. And that's where it starts, the animal studies. What usually happens in mice or even flatworms um, is reproducible in higher mammals like rhesus monkeys and usually translates pretty doggone good to humans. There are exceptions, but it's a, it's a great place to start. Absolutely. I think the take home message from me is even though it doesn't seem like much is happening, uh, there's a lot happening. And again, the, the research papers and the technology on this is, it's not just the thing that just kind of shaking you a little bit. Right, right. Now, one of the things when we talk, uh, I said, you know, I am just standing there. Uh, can I be doing something? And you guys were nice enough to send me a cable uh, to stretch and pull on, and I'm actually having a good time with that. So you can adapt this to do exercises while standing on it. Yes. Ironically or interestingly enough, we want people to, while they're on a juvent, take advantage of how mild it is and do something. And, you know, when I say we have a 98% success rate, we do take unit platforms back. I mean, it's really, I mean, there's been a lot of drama there. We take them back. Most of those have no usage. Oh, interesting. And one of the things we found is where you put it in the house. Because 20 minutes is a lot. That's yeah. two and a half hours a week. So we suggest you put it in the kitchen and do something. Read, exercise, surf the web, talk on the phone. But if I'm on the phone in my office, I'm on my juvent. No one knows I'm on it. It's that, it's that mild. And that way you kind of make use of that. You don't need to put it in the gym or the, you know, the middle of the room. You know, the units, GE White fits into most kitchens. It's great. So instead of a walking treadmill desk, which quite frankly, I can't stand, but uh, this sounds like a much better idea. Absolutely. Walking is magic. And a vitamin is a supplement. It's not a replacement. I call this a vitamin exercise. And I actually coined a term that I've talked to many PhDs, MDs. They all agree with me. And it's like a vita kin. What does that mean? Well, a vitamin was originally a vital amino. Yeah. It turned out not to be an amino, but the name stuck. So I realized new science needs new words. And this is a vital kinetic. So let's call it what it is, a vitakin. And you know what? It won't be the first. That term, I don't want to call it a specific the vitakin. It's a vitakin. Because as we learn more about mechanotherapy, we're going to find it. You know, an MD, PhD from Harvard, I'm quoting him. I can't remember his name. I apologize. But he said, when we understand mechanotherapy, it will be as significant as surgery was 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we need to name it what it is. It's a Vitakin. Let's, let's call it what it is. And that's a, something we need. That's the same dosing traits as a chemical vitamin. It's just mechanical. I warned you that we always have an audience question. <laughs> This one comes from at Wonderlush Diary from X. As I have a power plate, which I love. Why on earth would I switch to Juvent? 
Um, well, there's a good lead in. There you go. And word safety. A high energy plate. I'm yeah, not gonna that, pick there on are that. many. They can be effective. They can be convenient, but that doesn't mean they're safe. There's a chart. Maybe we'll pull it up on the screen of there's an entire body of science of vibration safety. It's doctors don't look at it. That doesn't mean it's not a sophisticated body of science. And in this chart, they give it engineers a quick, handy chart to find out what's safe. So on this chart, I put a line that shows Juven. And if you look at the safety re range, let's call this safe about here, that's right where Juven is. These high energy plates are literally off the chart. The chart wouldn't even, doesn't even consider it a topic. Hmm. I've consulted and I'm working with some of the world experts in occupational safety hazard. When I describe to them what we need to demonstrate in these, these high energy plates, they literally universally say, you've got to be kidding. People stand on that? I wouldn't allow any factory setting to even allow that for a minute. Now, and it's interesting, you see on these high energy plates, they're kind of CYAing, in my opinion, these dangers. Actually, in the fine print, say, don't stand on it. Hmm. So that high energy system would really have a, an application of extremities, you know, where you're putting this on it yeah. and not putting your brain or head or spinal cord. Because in the literature, as we predicted, and unfortunately it's coming true, there's already cases of a white paper. A white paper for the audience is a, it's basically a study of one. It's where a doctor will just document one patient and for the others to see. It's not you know, conclusive, and but it's a white paper. And for every white paper, you know, there's probably a thousand patients that didn't get a white paper. Right, right. Case report. And so, yeah. And so, but there's cases of detached retinas and uh, vascular injury in the brain. Now, most brain injuries, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, are not symptomatic at the time of the injury. This is why football players have symptoms way late. Right. The levels of energy on these high energy plates are well within TBI parameters. So when I'm saying they're not safe, I mean it. And there's going to be studies coming out on this. And so what we tell people is, you know, when they get a Juven, they'll get on it. And you see, Juven is effective. It just doesn't, it's not quite as remarkable, but it's all three, safe, convenient, and effective. Why not? Yeah. That's right. So that's really the difference. Now, to say is the high energy plate not effective? No, it is. It actually, the bone loves it. The bone can take that. And I equate it, it to drinking polluted water. Listen, if I drink pond water, it will cure my thirst. Okay, I can say this cures thirst, but I'm not really telling the full story. The body has to deal with the toxic effects of the water. Well, same thing with high energy vibration. The bone loves it. The rest of the body hates it. So that would be the key difference. Great way to summarize it. Thank you very much. And is that why, you know, there used to be, there was a trend early 2000s where these, and I'll just use the name since they mentioned it. Sure. All these power plate um, centers sprung up uh, where you pretty much all gone out of business as far as I can tell. Yeah. What's interesting is we, um, in a lot of physical therapy clinics, and what happens there is patients who come in for physical therapy will typically, they'll, they'll augment their normal treatment with Juvent. So we don't tell people to do this or that. We say this and that. Yeah. That makes sense. And then reevaluate it. But they'll use it for eight weeks, which is the typical PT visit. And after the eight weeks, they'll go, you know, I came in here for my knee, but all these other things are doing better. And then they'll regularly doing it. So the PT clinics have adopted Juvent's for that model. If you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast, you're definitely going to want to see this one. Take an exercise snack break. Every hour, just set your watch for five minutes. Go out, walk down the hall, walk down the stairs, take the elevator back. You'll get those steps in that you need.